Hello, how's it going? Yeah? Welcome to the DevNet Takeover for ACI. We are super excited to have all of you here and have all of these ACI-related activities going on. I'm going to take you through a really quick view of what some of those are. And we also want to welcome Roland Akra, Senior Vice President and GM of the Data Center Business Group. So thank you for joining us in the DevNet Zone. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you all for coming. So can you tell us a little bit about how you see the role of coding and developers and how that affects the data center business group? Yeah, um, I would say that we, we've, we're, we've completely entered the phase where um, every piece of the infrastructure is now something to be coded on as opposed to, I guess, scripting or CLIing. And uh, largely because what it allows people to do is to compose their own automation or their own uh, composition stack on top. And so we strive very hard on delivering automation to people. And you know, often we hope we've done completely the job. But inevitably, people have use cases we haven't thought about or want to compose things by mixing and matching what they want the way they want. And that's why we're so excited about offering the programmatic interfaces, the open languages, the Ansible playbooks and all of that is because people sometimes want to cook their own dish right. in addition to us hopefully providing a tasteful dish. That's great, that's a great analogy. Um, so when we talk about DevNet, we spend a lot of time thinking about the community and the way that the developer community can contribute back in to some of those things that we're building. And so I wonder if in terms of you know, sample code or community involvement, are there things are, that you would like input on from the developer community? Or you would like things that you would like to point them to do or try out or areas to focus on? Yeah, yeah, so I mean, first off I would say, uh, make sure you visit the areas on DevNet where we have exposed a lot of these either contributed pieces of code or interfaces themselves. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I would love to hear um, in general, you look, I mean, I see too many people saying, we're done because we've produced APIs. So check the box, we're API ready. Anybody who's done code on APIs knows that there's, excuse me, crappy APIs and good APIs. There are APIs that know how to do forward you know, migration while maintaining compatibility and not breaking uh, old code or not. So those to us are the precious things to, to give us your feedback on, which is okay, well we have APIs, are they friendly? Are they usable? Do they let you accomplish your workflows in as few ways as you want? And are we doing a good job of maintaining them over time without breaking them for you, you know, the way somebody who doesn't do good APIs would? So those are, are really useful uh, pieces of input for us from the, from the people who, who again, um, eat the food that we're, we're putting out there to continue the, <laughs> the meal <laughs> analogy. <laughs> Thank you, that's fantastic. Okay, um, so now I just wanted to go over a couple of things that we have going on, and then we also want to introduce a few members from the ACI team so that you can have the opportunity to mingle with them and talk to them during the takeover. So three quick things. One, um, there's a place over here called the Amazing Race. This is a challenge on your knowledge of ACI. So if you are you know, top notch on your ACI API skill knowledge, you should go try that challenge. The fastest time will win an iPad at the end of the hour. So everyone can try it out. It's very quick. Um, it's a quick quiz and we wrote a lot of fun ACI related questions um, that are going to be in that amazing race. The other thing is, oh I didn't, didn't plan that very well, did I? Um, we have special ACI t-shirts. ACI um, Anywhere t-shirts. They have a cool Barcelona graphic on the back. And these are going to be given out everywhere in the DevNet zone, at the front desk, in the theater. We're going to be handing some out. And that's only for this hour. It's a special part of the takeover. So this is the only time collector's edition ACI DevNet takeover t-shirts you can get. Um, woo, yeah. And then we've got a few other things. We have an ACI demo happening right behind the theater with all kinds of experts, and that's probably where a lot of the technical team can gather and people can hang out. And then we have sangria and snacks happening as well. I was afraid you were going to forget that. Oh, no, that's an important <laughs> one. That's right. Okay, so would you like to introduce um, some of your team just so people can recognize them? Yes, I know the, the, the spirit of this is, of course, you guys uh, having the opportunity to ask questions of the engineers who write the code, the product teams, and technical 
marketing folks. So we have a number of them uh, there. Srini, who's gonna, who leads the product management, by the way, on ACI, and is gonna give us a short presentation about ACI anywhere. Ranga works on all aspects of third-party interoperability, us calling other people's APIs, other people calling our APIs. He's managed, I think, coming up to 70 partnerships with every firewall vendor on the planet, every application delivery vendor on the planet, every security vendor on the planet. And last but not least, Ronak. Ronak Desai is the vice president of engineering of the entire ACI development team. So if you don't like an API, if you, if you hit a bug, no, <laughs> bugs come to me, compliments go to him. <laughs> Thank you all so much for joining us here. It's great to be able to connect the community with those technical leaders. Thank you. Really appreciate it. We look forward it. to chatting around with you guys over the next hour. Grab your sangrias and we'll go we'll go chat around. Yep. And now we're going to turn it over to Trini to for the presentation on ACI. Thank you so much. Okay. Clicker not working, I think. <laughs> yes, you can, <laughs> but not you, fam. All right, thank you. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session on ACI Anywhere. Uh, but before I get started, I want to by a quick show of hands. How many of you are familiar with ACI Anywhere? Just quick show of hands. Or is this kind of first session? OK. All right. So uh, what I'm going to do in this session is uh, briefly talk about you know, what we're seeing from a data center perspective in terms of how the infrastructure is evolving, and then uh, how ACI helps you address some of those requirements in terms of being able to deploy our applications more easily, manage your more applications easily, and as well as uh, adopt these multi-cloud architectures that are increasingly getting uh, more relevant for customers. So I'm going to be talking about the trends, introduce you through the journey of you know, ACI Anywhere. We got started on this journey about five years ago, and uh, we'll talk about you know, what we built in the last few years as well as what's coming uh, over the next uh, uh, six to 12 months. And then um, we can take questions uh, after the session, but it's going to be a brief session, and let's get started. So fundamentally, what we're seeing in data center is that the nature of applications is changing dramatically. What used to be traditionally monolithic applications, typically served in a client-server model, that is changing because of uh, changes that are happening in the industry, where in businesses are increasingly leveraging your technologies around machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence. So more and more applications are getting built to leverage those capabilities so that they can offer a better customer experience uh, for their customers and increasingly personalizing the applications so that they can enhance the customer experience by delivering the applications closer to where the consumption point is. Right. So uh, leveraging all those technologies from an application standpoint and really adopting architectures where the application is closer to the consumption point and the nature of applications also is changing in terms of what used to be centralized, where applications are hosted in the data center, uh, is changing in terms of applications now getting deployed more and more in a distributed manner. Typically, with emerging architectures such as 5G and you know, advancements in IoT, you're seeing these applications closer to micro data centers in the 5G architectures, as well as um, customers adopting these applications in a multi-cloud environment. So more and more uh, businesses typically are leveraging multiple services from different clouds. So for example, Office 365, you know, they're leveraging from Azure. Infrastructure as a service, they're leveraging from AWS. And then perhaps a container service from Google Cloud. So increasingly, they're looking at these multi-cloud architectures, applications getting more personalized, as well as applications getting deployed more closer to the consumption point. So what does this mean from a data center perspective? From a data center perspective, it means that you're no longer looking at data you know, in a centralized way. Data is everywhere. It is no longer centered. And which means the capabilities that you typically have to deliver 
from a data center perspective now have to be deployed in all these uh, different uh, environments, different domains, if you may. So you have your private cloud, the typical on-premise data center. You have the emerging technologies with 5G and IoT, where the applications are getting deployed in those edge locations. And you have, of course, the cloud environment, where you have AWS or Azure or Google Cloud, and perhaps you know, other uh, vendors such as IBM offering these uh, infrastructure services. So increasingly, you're looking at data that is more and more distributed, more and more agile from a developer standpoint. So developers are building applications that are going to be more personalized. So what does it mean from a networking perspective? So to help customers adapt to these architectures, we built ACI Anywhere. It's, it's been a five-year journey for us, and uh, we've built a set of capabilities that allows customers to tap into these distributed architectures, distributed data centers, and ACI Anywhere fundamentally speaks to those set of capabilities. We have a set of capabilities which, you know, on-premise we have developed about five years ago, and over time we have developed capabilities such as virtual ACI as well as cloud ACI, and I'm going to talk about what those capabilities are uh, in the next few uh, slides. So where did we get started? We obviously started in the on-premise data center. And fundamentally what we did there five years ago is that we built a programmable infrastructure that allows customers to deploy applications more easily and be able to manage it more uh, easily. And this is where you know, emerging SDN technologies were coming in, and Cisco's response to those emerging technologies was uh, ACI, application-centric infrastructure. And what we focused on there is typically, uh, you know, in, in the SDN framework, we built a controller. For those of you who are not familiar with what ACI is, I'm going to kind of quickly go over what the key components are. So we built a control plane, which is a controller, which is the application policy infrastructure controller that manages a two-tier fabric, a leaf-spine topology. So in the data center, we automated the bring up of the network. You, know, you can do that at scale, and I'll talk about what those capabilities are. And also not just bring up the network automation, but some of the adjacencies in terms of being able to automate your services. So you have load balancers, you have firewalls in your infrastructure, and you can automate those services as well. Uh, and all this is managed through a single controller. So we built a policy framework. And when I talk about policy, essentially it is a simple way for you to describe which endpoint can talk to which other endpoint, and what can they talk about, right? So for example, in a typical three-tier application, it could be, can my web tier talk to my app tier? Or my app tier can talk to database tier. Because you want to segment these application tiers, you want to allow access only to you know, permitted set of endpoints. So we built a policy model, and that's an abstraction. So it was uh, policy-driven automation for network bring up, as well as allowing all these services automations which are adjacent to the network. Not only that, we also took a hypervisor agnostic approach. And this was a big differentiator for us compared to some of the other solutions that were in the market at that point. So we are agnostic in terms of you, know, you could have a VM running on VMware infrastructure. You could have a VM running on Microsoft infrastructure or a KVM-based hypervisor. And we also integrated with all the cloud automation frameworks in terms of you know, controller integrating with, from an ecosystem perspective, with Virialize or with System Center or Azure Pack or also open stack environments. And we took this same policy agnostic or hypervisor agnostic model to any endpoint. So your endpoint could be a bare metal, it could be a virtual machine, or it could be a container. We don't care what the endpoint is, we don't care what the hypervisor is. And so this hypervisor agnostic approach allowed us to automate any endpoint for any infrastructure. So that's the first you know, manifestation of what we did with ACI. And of course, you get complete visibility in terms of what's happening in the infrastructure. The controller becomes your single point, single pane of glass, where you would go to provision the policy, where you would go to get full visibility for your troubleshooting and automation functions. And the other key aspect of ACI was also the fact that we built an integrated overlay model, which means you don't have to have two networks. You don't have to have a physical network and an overlay network. We collapse that into a single integrated architecture. So you manage one network, whether it's a virtual layer or a physical layer. And you get correlated visibility at an application or a tenant level with these capabilities. So over time, as customers started deploying this architecture, they came up with more and more use cases. And the use cases were, look, it's great that you have this single fabric that you can automate for network and service functions, but I want to expand this to multiple fabrics. And that's been a journey, right? So we took a few steps in terms of getting to that point. Fundamentally, this was driven by the need to isolate their infrastructure and also be able to scale their infrastructure. So one of the first 
evolutions of that single fabric architecture was what we call multi-part. Think of this as a way for you to isolate your control plane functions, you know, the ISIS or Kube protocols that are running within your infrastructure, you want to be able to isolate at the pod level. However, from a management standpoint or a policy definition standpoint, you would still have a single policy plane, which is a single management uh, epic cluster. So two parts, control planes are isolated, um, and typical use cases would be you know, in the same physical location, for example, if you want to have multiple floors and because of cabling constraints you want to isolate those domains, you can configure them as two different pod zones and then manage that through a single policy controller. And all this is, of course, built in the Nexus uh, 9K uh, infrastructure. So this gives you availability and this gives you scale. And in the single pod, you can scale all the way up to 200 leaves. And a leaf typically has about 48 ports. So that's 48 times 200 per pod in terms of the number of server endpoints that you can have. And you can scale that into multiple pods up to 12 pods. So that's multi-pod architecture. And over time, again, um, uh, you know, in terms of latency, for example, you can have these pods be supported anywhere up to a latency of 50 milliseconds. That roughly translates to about 2,500 miles. So plenty of you know, distance in terms of coverage. All this can be managed to a single epic cluster. Over time, we had requirements from customers where they wanted to deploy a smaller footprint of the infrastructure. So let's say you have a branch office or a satellite data center, and you would not want to deploy an entire ACI fabric, because the ACI fabric requires you to have three epic nodes to form a cluster, and then you have two layers of spine and leaves. So that footprint, a minimum footprint, would be a 9 hour system for you. A lot of customers have satellite locations where they don't have the need or the luxury to deploy the entire fabric. So what we did is we built a capability called Remote Leaf. And Remote Leaf is essentially uh, a leaf that is connected to the spine just over multiple hops. So so long as you have IP connectivity between a remote leaf, which is a Nexus 9K leaf, to the on-premise instance, you will be able to manage that Nexus 9K leaf just as you would manage a leaf that is directly connected to the fabric. So this is a capability that allows customers to scale their environment from on-prem to multiple locations. Today we support up to 20 such remote locations and with a latency of up to 300 milliseconds. So this gives you the ability to extend policy into those branch offices, into those satellite uh, data centers. Again, all this is managed by a single epic cluster, right? Now, there was a requirement from customers, typically you know, large enterprises with multiple data centers uh, across geographies and service providers, to improve the scale and also go, in terms of availability, more isolation. So in the previous architecture that you saw, you had a single epic cluster with a single point, uh, single cluster that gives you the policy configuration capabilities. So they wanted an air gap between those cluster capabilities also. So we evolved this architecture from a scale perspective, from an availability perspective, into what's called the ACI multi-site orchestrator. The key difference here is that each fabric is now managed by a local epic cluster. And then all these multiple epic clusters are coordinated from a policy perspective through the multi-site orchestrator. So that's the new product we introduced that's called multi-site orchestrator. This is not a controller. Think of this as a policy composer. This is where you go to define the policy and that policy then gets pushed to these different epic clusters. A typical example would be if you have a data center in Barcelona and a data center in London, and you want to push a policy that is specific to the Barcelona data center and a policy that is specific to the London data center, you can do so at the multi-site orchestrator level. In fact, you can define a policy that can stretch across these two different sites. So multi-site is essentially giving you that ability to push policy, define policy across these different sites. By site, I mean an instance, you know, Barcelona is a site for you, London is a site for you. So this cross-site capability to define the policy and push the policy is what uh, the orchestrator is all about. Not only that, it gives you visibility, right? So it gives you correlated visibility in terms of what's happening in both these sites. You can actually have instances of applications that are spread across these sites, where you can set a policy saying my web tier is in Barcelona and my application tier is in uh, London and you can set a policy across these two uh, instances as well. So multi-site gives you that capability. You can also do live migration of workloads across these instances. You can do stretch layer two. And fundamentally what you get with this architecture is the ability to scale. So this is architecturally built to scale all the way up to 128 sites. And within each site, you can have up to 400 leaves. 
and you can have a combination of architectures where you have multi-pod and you have multi-site. So you can get more isolation from a control plane standpoint. You get more scale. So all these are capabilities which we have been shipping uh, for over a year, multi-site, uh, you know, for scalable networks in combination with you know the remote leaf architecture that you see there. Primary use case again: active active data center deployments, disaster recovery use cases. So if my site in Barcelona goes down, I want to be able to bring up that infrastructure in the London data site without having to re-IP my instances. So IP mobility is a key use case for you know disaster recovery use cases. Also live migration. Uh, for disaster avoidance, uh, you know, if you have stretch clusters, for example, across two data centers, your storage is available in both the data centers, and your network is available in both the data centers, so you'll be able to actually move your workloads uh, without having to replicate your storage or re-IP your uh, network instances. So all these are capabilities that multi-site in conjunction with some of the other capabilities from storage perspective, customers could leverage for the disaster recovery as well as uh, you know, business continuity requirements. Now, from a latency perspective, uh, the key thing to note here is that multi-site is not in the control plane, so which means you get more availability. And multi-site can talk to any of these epic clusters, and the latency we support is all the way up to one second. So pretty much any data center across the globe, you could bring into this architecture and provide connectivity, and also provide policy push to these different instances. So massive scale, massive latency, Today we support up to 12 sites, but as I mentioned, architecturally, there is nothing that's stopping us to go to 128 sites. We just need to qualify based on customer requirements. Okay. So moving on from multi-site orchestrator, uh, we provided a set of other functions, and this was primarily driven around, driven by the fact that when we launched ACI, uh, it was the capabilities were tied to the Nexus 9K hardware. We had built in some policy elements in the Nexus 9K hardware that provides the policy enforcement capabilities, policy distribution capabilities. So customers who wanted to deploy ACI had the requirement to have an Nexus 9K hardware footprint. And that was a challenge for a lot of customers because they were not ready to replace their existing investments in older you know, technologies that are based on Nexus 5K and 7K. So to help their use cases, we built a capability called ACI Virtual Edge. Think of the ACI Virtual Edge as the virtual instance of your physical leaf. So a physical leaf today uh, has a function where the controller talks to the physical leaf and there's an agent that is policy agent that is sitting in the physical leaf that distributes that policy. So we took those functions that are in the Nexus 9K hardware leaf and virtualized that and put that into a VM. And the beauty of this is that you're no longer tied to any particular hypervisor. So you don't have to leverage existing kernel APIs that are tied to a particular hypervisor. You can take this architecture to a multi-hypervisor environment, you know, KVM or Hyper-V or ESX-based, and provide these ACI virtual edge functions. What you get with this is the ability to enforce policy on the virtual edge instead of the leaf. So now from a scale perspective too, you can look at, you know, the controller pushes the policy to the leaf, and from the leaf you get that policy enforcement on the virtual edge. This sits on a host. And of course, you can scale this in terms of, uh, it's a trade-off between your compute resources and the policy requirements that you have, but fundamentally, you get that ability to scale and also enforce policy on the host without being tied to a particular uh, virtual environment. So that's Virtual Edge, which you know, we've been shipping for a while, and uh, uh, it's doing really well. Uh, but again, uh, there was a requirement from a set of customers who said, I want to be able to take the same ACI architecture to bare metal cloud. Right? So uh, you know, companies like IBM, or OVH have bare metal clouds, uh, where I don't want to insert an XS 9K to get the ACI capabilities, but I want to extend that ACI functionality into those environments. So how do I evolve this architecture to provide that capability? And this is where the virtual ACI capabilities that we have built come into play. So again, extending the same concept where we virtualize the functions in the leaf, we also virtualize the functions that were in the spine. In the ACI architecture, the spine essentially provides one key function, which is there's a mapping database for endpoint reachability. So we virtualize that mapping database and put that into what's called a virtual spine. So you have a virtual spine and a virtual leaf, and then in conjunction with the ACI virtual edge, you're pretty much virtualized everything that your leaf spine topology was giving you. The key requirement, of course, here is that you are tethered to an on-prem instance. There's an on-prem instance and an epic cluster that's sitting there, and these virtual parts can be deployed on bare metal clouds. So you're now extending from your on-prem 
VSA capabilities into the virtual environment uh, on a bare metal. The use cases, again, for customers who have legacy infrastructure, uh, they will be able to use the ACI virtual pod capabilities to extend ACI into those legacy infrastructures without having to replace the 5K, 7K investments. So that's, again, another benefit of a virtual pod, where customers are no longer required to have a physical footprint. They don't have to rip and replace their existing infrastructure. They can take the ACI policy model and uh, you know, attach it to workloads that are running on older generation uh, infrastructure. It's also a key migration use case. So if you're looking to move from existing infrastructure to ACI down the line, virtual pod and AVE can give you that ability to you know, slowly migrate your workloads from a non-ACI to an ACI environment. This is also a shipping product, uh, and uh, you know, we're seeing a lot of customer interactions here. Uh, over time, we would scale this from a virtual pod perspective beyond the 64 number that you see. Uh, but again, more scale, decoupling from the hardware requirements that you have, and really being able to extend ACI policy into those bare metal environments, whether it's you know, IBM Cloud or you know, any other bare metal cloud that you would like to extend it, you can do so. And now really going, and so these are, whatever I talked so far, this is all shipping capability, this is available, you know, and what's coming now, which you're going to see a lot of uh, uh, announcements here at the Cisco Live event, is the work we are doing with the public cloud integrations. So fundamentally what we have done here is, if, if you look at, you know, the Epic controller, the controller has, you can roughly break the functionality of a controller into two layers. There is an upper layer that uh, abstracts out the policy parameters. So, you know, ACI policy constructs that you have in terms of tenants and contracts and all the policy elements. Think of that as the upper layer that provides you that policy abstraction. And the lower half of that controller functionality is about figuring out what the VXLAN routing is, what my hardware, you know, the hardware switches that I have, and where to enforce the policy, where the workload movements are happening. So what we have done is taken that upper part of the functionality of the controller, the policy abstraction part, and put that into a cloud. So what you see there in terms of CEPIC or the cloud controller, you deploy that in your AWS instance. In, in the equivalent of uh, you know, what you have on the on-prem, in the on-prem you have an infra VRF. In the AWS instance you will have the infra VPC. So once you deploy this cloud controller, cloud EPIC, you now get the same functionality that you get on-prem in terms of providing all the functions such as you know, multi-set that I talked about. So think of this as now instantiating a site in AWS, instantiating a site in Azure, or any other cloud that you like to. All this is again managed by the multi-set orchestrator. So multi-set orchestrator, again, becomes that single you know, remote, universal remote control for you that gives you the ability to extend policy into the public cloud environment. So the, from a policy abstraction perspective, what we do is the ACI policy that you have on-prem, we translate that policy to cloud-native policies. So the security groups or the filters and concepts that you have in the public cloud map automatically to the ACI policy concepts that we have. So a security group would map to an endpoint group and so on and so forth. So all this mapping is done automatically through the cloud controller that you have. You still get the ability to extend this policy and you know, have a combination of these sites. You can have multiple on-premise data centers, you can have a remote leaf, you can have a public cloud instance, and you're able to seamlessly connect all these different instances through the multi-site orchestrator. You'll also get the ability to correlate visibility. So you have cloud instances, you have on-prem instances, and the health scores for all these different endpoints, you can go through the multi-site orchestrator to meet your operations requirements. It's all about compliance, governance, so all that functionality, multi-site orchestrator becomes that single point of uh, management uh, in, in, in this uh, multi-cloud environment. So this is AWS. You're going to see a lot more you know, information. If you go to the booth, you will see some of the demos there. Uh, we're also extending the same capability to Azure. Same model in terms of the architecture, but the policy model is, of course, different. Uh, the policies that are applicable in the context of AWS, a different translation needs to happen. The terminology is different. You know, it's a VPC in the case of AWS, but it'll be a VNet in the case of Microsoft. But the same architecture, same concepts, and the ability to scale into these environments is uh, what uh, you'll will, you will see um, with this integration that we've provided. In terms of uh, connectivity itself, uh, I want to call out Tiki benefits here, right? So 
if you look at the, uh, in a multi-cloud environment, if you want to, and we have done some measurements in our lab, uh, if you have a multi-cloud environment, you know, you want to deploy instances in AWS and deploy instances in Azure and on-prem and seamlessly be able to connect this. Uh, a typical instance where you have a tier in each of these clouds, and if you want to connect them, takes about 3,000 plus commands. With this architecture, through the multi-set orchestrator, through a few clicks, a handful of clicks, you'll be able to seamlessly connect all these different environments. And you'll, you'll see a lot more detail in the demo that you're going to see in the keynote tomorrow that Roland is going to be uh, showing in terms of how you know, that workflows happen. So seamless connectivity across all these different environments uh, with security. So we built a capability called CloudSec. CloudSec is essentially a way for you to encrypt the logical tunnel, the logical VXLAN tunnel that you have between endpoints. So you get encrypted connectivity between all these different cloud environments. You also get, the, as I said, visibility and uh, simplicity. So connection at scale with simplicity and the ability to have a single policy that you can carry across all these different environments. So those are the three key things which are really differentiating in terms of how we are approaching this multi-cloud capabilities uh, compared to some of the other solutions that, that are out there in the market. Right? So this is um, shipping, this will be shipping in uh, towards the end of the you know, Q1 calendar 2019 timeframe. And you will see us evolve the same architecture into multiple uh, cloud environments, you know, Azure being the next, and then uh, other clouds uh, following you know, from a roadmap standpoint. So that's the architecture. ACI Anywhere essentially is giving you the ability to connect multiple data centers, is giving you the ability to take the data center to where the data is. So in this case, you know, Edge is where a lot of action is happening in terms of applications, micro data centers that are getting instantiated in the edge. So putting the application closer to the consumption point, being able to take the policy into those environments, and really providing that efficiency, speed of response with 5G architectures that becomes increasingly important, and the ability to also take it to colos, because a lot of enterprise customers obviously would first terminate in a colo and then on-ramp to a public cloud. So with this architecture, you will be able to deploy ACI anywhere, whether it's a colo, whether it's a public cloud instance, whether it's on-prem, your branch offices, or any other location. So that's the vision of ACI. We have pretty much delivered all the capabilities with AWS announcement that you're going to see uh, at this event. Uh, you, and you can, you know, obviously more capabilities for Azure and Google will come in uh, down the line. So that's where we are. Um, I'll be happy to take any questions after this event, but thank you for your time and uh, enjoy the rest of the show.